Hey folks, it's about 11.57 a.m. Boston time. I will, we'll get started at 12 o'clock sharp. Frank uh, Gill is already ready and all excited to go. Indeed. Be sure that um, everybody can see my screen. I uh, can just put it in the chat here saying, if you can see my screen, please. Okay, so David Bassan says he can see it. Awesome. Thank you, David. Appreciate that, my friend. Okay, folks, it's exactly 12 o'clock Boston time. So I'm just going to go through some of the introductory slides as a part of my moderating task here. So just bear with me for a couple of minutes before you go on to the feature film of the day, which is the transaction logs by Frank Hill. So, so we thank our sponsors, Quest and Susie, and uh, without them, we cannot have a lot of these events that we have. Uh, if you are going to be missing out on the past summit, 6th through 9th of November, you have no idea what you're missing. So please try and make it. If the It's just like basically drinking out of the fire hose. You'll thoroughly enjoy every single piece of information that you get out of there. So, so there are two discounts, right? you can get all the past 2017 uh, content now uh, by going to this particular website and by entering this code. And you can still get $150 code, or I mean $150 discount if you enter the same code uh, while registering for the past summit. And part of that actually goes back to our group uh, for you know doing whatever we do our best. Uh, if you know of anyone who you would like to nominate for the Passion Award, uh, this is the best time to do so. Uh, the links are given below. And well, past stuff, I haven't seen this before, but yes, you can definitely go ahead and buy a lot of this online now. So just if you're moving around with one of these, you can really prove that you're a solid geek. Um, so these are the activities for the 2018 summit. So we have a buddy program, uh, which basically means that once you are there, you'll get somebody who will be teamed up with you for a long time. Uh, there's some game nights there, um, birds of the feather luncheon. I strongly suggest that you should join there if you're going to be there. 
the Women in Technology luncheon is awesome. Uh, even if you're not a woman, I would strongly suggest go ahead and attend that. We had one uh, in the recently concluded Boston SQL Saturday, and uh, it was absolutely jam-packed room. So Facebook Live, right? Upcoming sessions, uh, right? Kellen Delaney, the goddess of SQL, I think her handle is SQL goddess too. Uh, definitely, she's going to be there. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot. We have so many virtual groups, which if you can't count, it's about 30 of them. And you can, I'm sure you'll find at least two or three of these, which meet your educational and professional uh, goals. So I myself have the fun, pleasure of running the past this group that is the BBA virtual group and the past uh, professional development group and I would hope to see some of you guys on that too. So the upcoming SQL Saturdays here in the US are going to be in Pittsburgh, Orlando, Minnesota, Memphis, Columbus, Charlotte and Lincoln and in Latin America in Sao Paulo, Puerto Rico, uh, El Salvador and Salvador and of course there are a few on the European side too so Hope you guys can enjoy those. Uh, join pass if you have not joined already. I do believe if you are logged in, you are logged in through the pass website. But if not, have your friends join them. Not only helps you network with others, but also improve your skills, your knowledge, and yes, you can build your resume. So connect and stay connected with pass through Facebook. Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Uh, SQL Pass is the handle, and uh, Pass Community is the other handle, and SQL Pass is the hashtag. So without much ado, let me talk about Frank Gill, my friend. Uh, Frank is a senior data engineer at Concurrency with 19 years of IT experience. Uh, the first eight as a mainframe programmer. Uh, sorry, Frank. He has developed a love of all things internal. When not administering databases or geeking out on internals. Frank volunteers at the Art Institute of Chicago and reads voraciously. So please welcome my good friend, uh, Frank. And I am going to make him the presenter. How do I do that? Staff, Frank Gill. Make him presenter. Here you go. So I was Frank. All right. And I put myself on mute too. And uh, folks, if you have any questions, uh, just shoot them. I'm monitoring the chat window here if there are any questions, okay? Here you go. So let me know when you can see the slides. Looks good. Okay, so the only thing I'll add to uh, the intro, I volunteer at Paws Animal Shelter here in Chicago. Um, this is my contact information. Uh, if you want to, if you have questions during the session, um, you can put them in the chat. If you have questions for me afterwards, um, or more detailed questions you want to get into in the discussion here, you can either send me a message on Twitter or email me. Um, I joke that I like to talk about this stuff and my wife doesn't, so any and all questions are welcome. And I love talking about the trend law. It's my favorite SQL Server topic. So, so to talk about what we're going to get into, I'm going to give a high-level overview of what a transaction is, um, what asset properties are, and how transactions help SQL Server uh, meet the asset properties or the asset requirements, the transaction log architecture, how the transaction log is structured internally, and that will get us into virtual log files. Um, then I'm going to talk about a concept called bet log space reservation. So um, how the way that you write code and the way that code processes through SQL Server can affect the growth of the log and help you optimize transaction log usage. Um, I'm going to talk about batching transactions and then finally rollback activity and what that means and how that can affect the way that the transaction log performs. Um, so just getting into what a transaction is. You can think about a transaction as a unit of work in the database. And everything that SQL Server does 
happens in a transaction. Um, any insert, update, delete behavior, anytime that you modify a schema, that happens in a transaction. And all transactions begin. So when you start an insert, that transaction will begin. And depending on how you handle that transaction, when that transaction finishes, it will commit and that transact, the other thing that the transaction can do is roll back. And all transactions are tracked in the transaction mode. So all of the activity that is running against the database in terms of data manipulation and schema manipulation is tracked in the transaction log. So SQL Server has two types of transactions and the default behavior in SQL Server is auto commit. So when you write code, you can wrap that code. So if I'm doing an insert into a table, I can code begin transaction, the beginning of that insert statement, and then commit transaction at the end of that statement. And that is what's called an explicit transaction. So I have said, I want to start this transaction, do my work, and then commit it. In SQL Server with auto commit as the default behavior, if I open up Management Studio and say insert a row into a table with no begin transaction or commit transaction, SQL Server wraps that internally in the transaction log in a begin transaction and commit transaction. And that is what's called an implicit transaction. So as I said, everything SQL Server does, it does in transactions and with auto commit on, which is the default, it will commit that transaction when it is done. So I said that you can, you start a transaction, you can either commit to the transaction or roll that transaction back. And there are two types of rollbacks. You can explicitly code a rollback and I'll demonstrate this at the end of the presentation. But um, one of the ways that you'll see this used is in error handling. So if I have code that I'm running and um, I want to kick to a catch block. I've got to try catch logic in a procedure um, and something goes wrong. I can kick to that catch block and I can roll back the transaction that is running. So to do that, you explicitly code rollback transaction. The second type of rollback is an implicit rollback. And this will occur if you kill a transaction so or you kill a SPID. So let's say I'm running an insert and it's taking longer than I expected to, or it's consuming more resources than I wanted to, I can kill that process ID and that will cause a rollback. If my SQL Server instance crashes in the middle of a transaction, so I am running a query that is going to um, insert 100,000 rows, and in the middle of that insert, 50,000 rows in, my SQL Server service restarts for some reason. When the instance comes back up and online, it will roll that transaction back. And I'll demonstrate what this looks like uh, when I get into the demos. So um, the transaction log and transactions allow SQL Server to adhere to what are called the ACID properties. And the ACID properties sit at the base of any relational database system. Um, they were developed, I believe, in the mid-1970s um, and have been modified and I believe the early 80s is when these were written in stone. So any relational database system that you're working with is going to adhere to these properties. ACID is an acronym and the four words that make up the acronym are listed. Um, atomicity means that a transaction is all or nothing. So that example where I talked about inserting 100,000 rows, that 100,000 row insert has to happen all the way through or it doesn't happen at all. If it crashes at the 50,000 row mark, I can't leave the database in that state. Those 50,000 inserts have to roll back. Um, consistency states that a transaction has got to take the database from one consistent state to another. So you can think about this term in terms of foreign key restraints or other 
uh, constraints between tables. If I'm inserting data to a table, that table is foreign key to another table. Those foreign key relationships all have to update successfully as part of the transaction. Isolation means that transactional activity, individual transactions cannot collide with one another. So if I start a transaction and it's updating the majority of the rows in a table, um, that table will be locked for the duration of my transaction. And anyone else who's trying to manipulate rows in that table will be blocked until my transaction completes. And I'll show you how that gets managed in the transaction log. And then finally, durability is the idea that once a transaction commits, it has to be available in the database regardless of what happens. And the way that SQL Server does this is by flushing the log records associated with the transaction to disk immediately upon commit. The data pages associated with that transaction can stay in memory. The SQL Server tries to persist things in memory for as long as possible to optimize its performance, but the transaction log is written to disk. And this is what allows you to do rollback and roll forward, which I'll talk more about as I get into the demos. So that takes us into transaction log architecture. So when you allocate a, or when you create a database in SQL Server, you'll get at least two files. You get a data file, which is where the data pages for that database live, and you get a transaction log file. The physical transaction log file is allocated on disk, and the uh, standard extension for that file is .ldf. That physical file is divided into virtual uh, units called virtual log files, and I'll refer to these from here on out as VLFs. And VLFs are designed to be reused, and the transaction log is designed to be a circular file. And I'll show you a demo of what that means uh, in a moment. But the virtual log files, so these virtual units that the physical file is divided into, can have one of two statuses. And actually, now there's a third status. Paul Randall just published a blog post about a third status that I haven't included in here, but I can talk about briefly. Um, the two statuses I will talk about are free and active. Um, when you create that database and that log file is new, you will have one active VLF because SQL Server always needs an active VLF. It needs somewhere to write transaction log records. Um, a VLF, you know, that initial VLF is active, and then as you are writing transaction records into the log, VLFs will become active as they are used. And the VLF will remain active as long as there are log records in that VLF that SQL Server needs. And a couple of examples of things that SQL Server needs a log record for. Um, if you're running in full recovery, you need those log records until a log backup is run. If you're running in simple recovery, you need to keep those log records around until an operation called a checkpoint runs. Um, and the checkpoint runs approximately every 30 seconds. So if you're in simple, it will um, check VLFs, and if they are not needed, it will free them up. In full, the log backup needs to happen to do that. Um, if you're running any sort of high availability functionality, uh, so log shipping, mirroring, availability groups, the activity is being processed over to your secondary via the transaction log in all of those cases. Log shipping, you're pulling the transaction log back up, moving it over and restoring it. Uh, mirroring, you're pushing records over. And then availability groups, you're syncing the logs between the primary and secondary replicas. So log records can be required for high availability. And then finally, roll back, roll forward activity. And I'll talk about that more in detail at the end in the demo. So just to give you a visual representation of what this looks like, um, this is the simplest log architecture you can have. Um, on create, you'll get four VLFs, at, at least depending on the size, the initial size of your log file. 
And as I said, you always require um, one active VLF. So I've created my database. I've got my four VLFs. VLF one is active. Now I start transaction one and transaction one commits. The transaction log records for transaction one have spanned from VLF one into VLF two. So VLF two has now gone active. Tran two starts and commits. It spans into VLF three. So I now have three active VLFs with VLF four free. And transaction three starts, and the arrow indicates that transaction three has begun, but it has not committed. So now I have four active VLFs, and um, I have transaction three that is currently in flight and continuing to write log records. So at this point, my database is in full recovery. As I said, to free up VLFs when you're in full recovery, you require to run a log backup. So if I run a transaction log backup at this point, it is going to free VLFs 1 and 2. VLFs 3 and 4 remain active because transaction 3 started writing records into VLF 3, and it's continuing to write records into VLF 4. So SQL Server is potentially going to require those records on rollback for rollback and roll forward activity. So that is what happens in full recovery when you run a tran log backup. Now, if transaction three continues to run and it hits the end of VLF four, in this state, it will wrap around. It will say, SQL Server will say, okay, I have hit the end of my transaction log file. I have hit the end of VLF four, which is the last VLF in my log file. There are VLFs available in the log file. I will begin to write transaction log records there. And so when I say that the log, the log is designed to be a circular file, this is what I mean. It will hit the end. If it has space at the beginning, it will write records at the beginning. And ideally, this is how you want to optimize your transaction log. Um, this will prevent log growths. I'll explain why that is a good thing. Um, and you can do this by properly scheduling your backups. If you're in full recovery, if you're in simple, um, you just need to get a handle on how much transactional volume is writing. And if you see runaway log growth, there are steps you can take to remediate that. But in full recovery, generally um, managing transactional scope, managing the amount of activity that's happening in a given transaction, and managing your log backups will allow SQL Server to optimize and reuse the log. Um, if you are in a state where you are here, so we're back to transaction three, hitting the end of VLF four, and all four of my VLFs are active, SQL Server will allocate an additional VLF or number of VLFs. Uh, prior to SQL Server 2014, the number of VLFs that was allocated or that were allocated are was were driven by the size of the file growth for the log file. Um, if you were less than 64 meg for your file growth, it would give you four. If it was less than a gig, it would give you eight. And if it was greater than a gig, it would give you 16. In 2014, they changed that algorithm and it looks at the size of the log file and your growth and it does some math and it says, okay, if we meet certain criteria, allocate a single VLF. And that's what I'm showing here. And it does this because the fewer VLFs you have, the better your log is going to perform. So that helps minimize your VLF count. So if you continue, so the, the scenario that I just described, where it allocates the additional VLFs, that is a scenario where I have auto growth turned on for the transaction log file. Um, so when you hit the end of the log file, SQL Server will allocate, will ask Windows to allocate additional space to the log file, and it will continue to run. If I don't have auto growth turned on for my log file, and transaction three hits the end of the log, I get a computer malfunction. 
um, effectively, I will no longer be able to write to the database. So inserts, updates, deletes, schema changes, any kind of processing that is writing to the database will stop working. And you'll see an error in the error log that tells you that you can't write to your database because the transaction log is full. Um, so this is a reason that you want to enable auto growth. Um, I did talk about it at the beginning, but so when you allocate the database, you get at least one data file and one log file. You generally, there, there's one case in which you would potentially want to have more than one log file. Because the log files are sequential, you start at the beginning, you write to the end. And the only time you're gonna use a second log file is when the first one fills up. So you don't get any performance benefit from having multiple log files. Um, the one case in which you would want more than one log file is if you got to this point where you filled up your log and it couldn't grow because either auto growth isn't enabled or you actually fill up your the drive in which your log file lives, you can allocate a second log file on a different set of storage, uh, give that to the database, it will allow the database to continue to function and write transaction log records, and you can then remediate the issues that you've got with the original log file. So that's the one case in which you don't want multiple. Uh, rule of thumb is just have one because it doesn't buy you anything to have multiple log files. So I talked about auto growth. Um, you want to have it on. You want to monitor your log file size and the amount of times your log is growing, but you want to have it on because if you don't have it on, it's working without a net. And if you fill up the log file, your database will stop working. You want to set it to a fixed amount. So when you create a database, when you create the log file, you give it an initial size. And with auto growth on, you have two options. You can either grow the file automatically by a fixed amount. So a gig, you're going to allocate a gig of space every time it grows, or you can grow it by a percentage. You want to grow by a fixed amount because if you grow by a percentage, your growth amount is going to grow every time an auto growth happens. So you want to do that, which is good to work things on a linear path rather than this, where it gets asymptotic and it just continues to grow. And what can happen with percent growth is in that scenario where I have a runaway transaction and my log file is growing with percent growth, it's going to fill up the log drive much faster with percent growth on. Um, it's a more controlled activity with a fixed amount. And as I said, you fill up your log drive, your database stops working, and that is generally not pretty. And I've been, actually, I've never been in that scenario in production. I've come very, very close or seen databases come very, very close, and it is not a good time. So avoid it at all costs. Um, so I have a demo, and actually I'm not going to run the demo, but I've got the um, results saved off. So what I have is a pair of databases. Um, there's a database called Big Log, and as I said, when you create a database, you get a data file, and that is this MDF file, and you get a log file, and that is the LDF file. And for my log file, my max size, or sorry, my initial size is um, eight gig. My max size is two terabytes. And my file growth is one gig. So every time, if I hit the end of this eight gig limit, my file is going to grow by a gig. Um, hey, Frank? Yes. Um, so Julie Beck is asking, why is the default auto growth still in percentage? Uh, it is not anymore. I think in 2016, they changed it. And I think it defaults to 64 meg now. Um, if you're running a version before 2016, it will still default for the log to a percent. And that is problematic and Microsoft took way too long to fix that. 
because um, people have been yelling about it for a long time. But I believe 2016, and I can confirm that it changed, the default behavior changed to um, grow by 64 meg. Thank you, sir. All right. Any other questions? Nope. Not. Yeah, I think actually you can see it here. This is a data file, but this was created in 2016 and it defaulted to 64 meg. So I think, I think I'm on point there. Um, so anyway, the big log database, the initial log file size is eight gig. It's gonna grow by a gig if I get to the eight gig limit. The second database is called small log and it has an eight meg initial size with a one meg growth. So what I did was I created these databases. I created a table in each database and then I inserted 100,000 rows to each database. And this is a query, and I'll make all these scripts available um, so you'll be able to create the databases, create the objects, and run these demos. But rather than have you sit and watch 200,000 inserts, I did it on the front end. And um, you can see this is a query that joins together a number of different pieces of information. Um, it shows me the VLF counts for free. The VLF status of zero is free. VLF two or status of two is active. So I get a count of VLFs grouped by status and an average size, table name, how many rows are in the table, how much space is reserved and used in the log, and then the log file size. And then the number of this last column is the number of milliseconds that the log growths took. So if we look, the big log database has 15 VLFs with a status of zero. So those 15 VLFs are free. Each one of those VLFs averages 513 meg in size. I've inserted the 100,000 rows and I've got just over 200,000 megabytes reserved, or sorry, 200, 200 megabytes reserved and 200 megabytes of data space. My log file is still eight gig because I've only used one VLF and I haven't had to grow that log. My small log that was initially eight meg and is growing by a meg each time it grows, I have 398 VLFs. Each one of those VLFs is a meg in size. I have the same number of rows and space usage. And my log file is only 400 meg, but it had to grow to add those VLFs and that growth took 768 milliseconds. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot of time, but keep in mind that this is a, a small table with narrow rows, and I've inserted 100,000 records in a single transaction. If you have this scenario with a production system and you're writing a much more volume of data, like a larger volume of data than 200 meg, this can grow very quickly and you can get a large VLF count and that log growth time um, can grow as well. Jump back over to the slides. So this gets into why you don't want to shrink the log. So I talked about a log backup. You're in full recovery, you run a log backup, um, and your VLFs will free up. The VLFs that are no longer needed, the log records are no longer needed, will be freed. But the physical file size will not shrink. So in the case of my eight gig log file, um, you know, if I, were to fill up that eight gig and allocate another gig of space. So I auto grow, my log is now nine gig. I run a transaction log backup. It's possible that I'll free up all of the VLFs with the exception of one, but even though that space is free and available for use, that log file will stay nine gig in size. Um, I have seen cases where transaction logs have grown to 500 gig and the client wants to shrink that space down 
And there are cases where you do want to shrink that space down because you have a poorly performing or badly behaving application and you want to reclaim that space and allow things, you know, modify code to optimize code. Um, but that shrink is going to take you, it's going to shrink that file physically, but if that file grew out, the transaction log file grew out, it grew out for a reason. So there was a transaction that ran that grew it to that point. So chances are you shrink it down, it's going to grow out to that same size again. And the log growth operation is one of the most expensive things that happens in SQL Server. And the reason for that is that the transaction log, when it grows, all of the space in the space that is allocated, all of the drive, all the disk in the space that is allocated has to be zeroed out. And the reason for that is that starting in SQL Server 2016, when you did an install or when you do an install, you get this checkbox in the installer and it is grant perform volume maintenance task privilege to SQL Server database engine service. And when you check that box, what that means is that when a data file grows, so I have a data file, I size it at eight gig, I hit the end of the file, I still need to write data into my database. So I'm gonna grow that by a gig. At that point, SQL Server requests the space from Windows. Windows gives the space to SQL Server and SQL Server just starts to write to it. It doesn't have to do anything to that space. It's just gonna overwrite what is already there. And there's a disclaimer here at the bottom. It says, if you check this box, there's a chance that if somebody actually gets a hold of your hard drive or is able to get a hold of your data files by doing forensics, they can see what was on that space that has been allocated previously. So they could potentially get a hold of some data. That checkbox, I check that by default. I mean, I'll discuss it with clients, but unless it's incredibly sensitive information, the bonus that you get from not having to zero that space out in the data file outweighs the security risk. If your hard drives are locked down, if you have decent security, um, you can prevent people from getting a hold of that, those raw files. With a transaction log, this process does not work. You have to zero out the space for the transaction log growth. And the reason is that because the transaction log is a sequential file and log records have a very um, defined layout, a defined structure, when C Windows gives that space to SQL Server, there is a chance that there could be something on that space that looks like a log record. And if I am writing log records to the space and all of a sudden something pops up that looks like a log record at the end of my log file, I will get transaction log corruption. And transaction log corruption is the, pretty much the worst thing that can happen to your database. So that operation of zeroing out that grown space is extremely expensive because you're pulling CPU, you're pulling IO, and you're using memory. And so you want to do everything you can to manage the transaction log size um, proactively rather than letting it grow and shrinking it down because shrinking it is resource intensive growing it back out is resource intensive so you want to try to minimize that as much as possible um, i talked through those two bullet points and then another reason that you want to um, optimize transaction log use is that I talked about the idea of the A in ACID, atomicity. So transactions are all or nothing. So as a transaction is running, SQL Server is reserving space for the transaction log records are writing that are writing, but it also needs to reserve space in the event of a rollback. So my transaction, it's inserting 100,000 rows, runs through 50,000 rows, and then the instance crashes. It's going to need to roll those 50,000 inserts back and SQL Server says, okay, that's potentially going to happen. So we will reserve some additional space in the transaction log. Um, hey, Frank, some is, interaction here, uh, if you don't mind. 
So there's one from Venshu uh, asking for a database with simple recovery model. Its log could grow to a very large size. Why is it? And stop it from growing, I guess, because if there's like one large transaction without intermediate commits, I think this right. Would so basically, you want to in that situation, it, it is most probably caused by a a large transaction that is running. So as that transaction, the transaction begins and it's running until it commits, and that gets into what I'm talking about right now. Um, you know, it's going to hold on to the VLFs. The VLFs that are associated with that transaction are going to remain active. And then also with this log space reservation, which we'll dem demo in a minute, you're going to be reserving additional log space on top of that. So it's just kind of a cascading effect that can cause your log to grow very quickly. Um, also, if you have a small log growth set, so if my log growth is set to a meg, as the log grows, it effectively stops receiving transaction log records until that growth finishes. And so I just run into an example where I have clients, a client that is writing images into a database. So they're writing gigabytes of information at a time. They have a one meg log growth set. So they write a gig that log has to grow 1,024 times. And so that just constant growth behavior can also cause um, the log processing to slow down and potentially see additional growth. So, you know, you want to look at your log growth parameter. You want to check and see long running transactions. And there are different ways that you can figure out what's causing the log growth and work from there. Um, if you want to send me more information about the specific scenario, I'd be happy to kind of give you more specific advice. But those are the things that I kind of look at on the top. Okay. And uh, there is one more. So sure. this is for a database that gets shut down from time to time. I don't know when that would happen. But log file be pre-allocated to the size it normally goes to. So for example, if the original size, I mean the expanded size of that database log file was say five gigs, uh -huh. uh, should whenever the database is restarted, should it automatically be set to five gigs? That was one question. I think there is a slightly similar question, if I'm not mistaken. It says we have a consistent problem with the log file growth on the sum of the always on databases. The log is committed on the secondary, but the primary refuses to release the VLFs, thinking it is still needed to be committed on the secondary, so the log continues to grow out of control. The only way out uh, is to remove the database from AG, shrink the log, and then re-add it to AG. Is that a way yeah, to the AG yeah. question, I need more information about exactly what's happening. So if you want to send me an email and give me some more details, I can address that. The first question, if if I understood the question correctly, they're shutting the database down, so taking the database offline. Um, or maybe or they, restarting the SQL Server, possibly. Restarting the SQL Server. So if you're restarting the SQL Server, mm -hmm. then the drive, I mean, the file remains the same size. Basically, right. the, the, the file lives on disk and it doesn't. It automatically lives. Okay, cool. All right. So that's one thing. And there are two more. Sorry, man. So oh, that's fine. When the SQL first starts, should it? Uh, so this earlier question was from Joel Isenstadt. I hope you can send the email to Frank. And then when SQL first starts, should it be configured to allocate logs to the size they normally grow to? So pretty much uh, the similar question is what we had seen earlier. And what is the default size of the VLF, and how can it be controlled? Um, so the default. So the VLF. The size of the VLF depends on how many you get and how big the log is. So if you allocate, I believe, a one gig file, um, so I build up a database with one gig file, it's going to give you 16 VLFs that are sized at 128 meg. Is that right? No, that's not right. Uh, 512. 512 meg. Um, that's not right either. It's going to divide. It's going to divide the one big by sixteen. And if I could do math, I'd be better off today. But 
So that will determine the size of your VLFs. If your log growth is set to a percentage, those VLFs will continue to get larger as it grows. So you can control VLF size by setting it to a fixed amount. And then, as I said, post 2014, 2014 and after, the VLF size will be controlled by, if you allocate a single VLF, it will be the size of that log growth um, if those that algorithm is met. Otherwise, it'll be divided by the number of VLFs that are allocated. I hope that answers the question. Cool. Thanks, Matt. All right, so uh, getting back to log space for reservation. So um, it reserves space on top of the space it's using for log records for the potential rollback. And this is a reason that you should batch your transactions. Um, the historical or kind of the, the way that I have seen this um, manifest itself in a real world scenario, and I've run into this more than a couple of times, is I have an application. That application is writing order data. The business at some point has said we have to retain two years worth of order data. So on a nightly basis or an hourly basis, they are flushing um, order data to an archive table. And after several years of this application running, that archive table gets really big and it's got billions of rows in it. And the business decides that, okay, we really don't need two years worth of data because we're paying a lot of money for storage or there are things going on and we don't need that data anymore. So we're gonna change that retention to two months. So somebody comes in and writes this delete statement delete from orders archive where order date is less than two months ago. It's going to run that delete. You know, in this case, I've got the begin transaction commit transaction explicitly coded. If I was to run that delete statement without the begin and commit, it would still wrap it in the begin and commit. And those potentially billions of deletes are going to happen in the same transaction. So because it's a single transaction, one, SQL Server is not going to be able to free up those VLFs with a log backup or a checkpoint or any other mechanism, and it's going to continue to reserve space for a potential rollback. So it's going to continue to grow the log. Each time the log grows, it's going to slow SQL Server down. And so it's just um, kind of a perfect storm where it will bring potentially bring the instance to its knees. Um, and let me do a quick demo of log space reservation. Uh, I can't see my solution taskbar. All right. So I talked about batching transactions. So what I'm gonna do here is I've got three queries. Um, the first query is going to capture information about what is writing into the log, the number of um, transactions that are being written, the number of records that are being written, the number of bytes that are being used, and the number of bytes that are being reserved. So if you think about the transactions running, it's writing records into the log, those records are consuming space. And then on top of that, it's reserving space for a potential rollback. So I'm gonna kick this off and I'm gonna let it run. And while that is running, and I don't highlight that line of code, I'm gonna execute two other scripts. The first script is going to run an update of every row in the table where um, every row on the table, and it's going to do it 10 times. So there are 100,000 rows in my table. I'm going to run those updates 10 times. I'm going to update a million rows. And I'm going to do that in one explicit transaction. So I'm running this while loop 10 times where I'm doing the update. That is wrapped in the begin tran and the commit. So I'll run that. And then I'm going to run the same million updates. So I'm going to update all 100,000 rows in a different table with the same schema 
10 times, but each of those transaction, each of those updates is wrapped in its own transaction. So I'm going to run 10 explicit transactions. So we'll run that. So that finishes, come back over here. So that is complete. Stop that. And then I am going to select from that table. So I was piping this information into a temp table. I'm going to select from that temp table and I'm going to group by transaction ID. So for the one tran, I've got one transaction ID. For the loop tran, I'm going to have 10 of them. So if I run this, that's all right. Apologies, I'm going to do this one more time. We may get some screwy results, but let's see. I'm going to run just a portion of that query. It's always something we present. Okay, so that is done. So let's give this a shot. Fingers crossed, it gives me what I'm expecting. Stop it. All right, so that is what I was expecting to see. So my one tran, so where I ran a single transaction and did the million updates, you can see that I wrote approximately a million records into the log for that transaction. I used 151 meg, so the transaction log records writing for those transactions used 151 meg of space, and I reserved 321 meg of space. Down here are my 10 explicit transactions where I'm running those in batches of 100,000. You can see that each one of those run approximately 100,000 rows. Each one of them used between 14 and 15 megabytes. And so if you add these numbers up, you will get approximately 151 meg. So from the actual log record usage, they're equal. But what's different is this 321 meg SQL Server reserved that and held on to it for the entirety of this transaction. For each one of these individual transactions, it grabbed the 31 meg of space, and when this committed, it released it. And then it grabbed 31 meg, 32, and so on and so forth. So effectively, what those batch transactions are doing is reusing the same reserved space. And that by batching the transactions and reducing the amount of space that's used by a factor of 10, it will reduce the need for log growths, it will reduce VLF usage, and it will just make things run better and faster. Um, and then keep in mind that in this scenario, once again, I'm dealing with very narrow rows. You know, the rows are probably less than 200 bytes, and I'm dealing with a volume of 100,000 rows. If you're dealing with a production environment where you have very wide tables, you have varchar max columns, and you're doing much more volume of activity, this 321 and 32, those numbers can get much bigger, much faster. So these are all reasons that you want to batch transactions with kind of specific examples of how SQL Server is using the log. Hey, Frank? Yes. Uh, just a time check, 10 more. Yep. Yeah, almost, I got what, 10, about nine minutes left? Yep, just okay. a minute. So that is log space reservation and reasons that you want to batch transactions. And to the question about the simple database growing, you know, the log growth growing, log file growing out of control, you want to try to isolate the transaction that is causing that behavior and look to fix that transaction. 
um, either by batching or just changing the way that it's behaving. And if you want to send me specific information about it, you know, let me know and I can make some suggestions and recommendations. So the last thing I want to talk about is rollback. So I talked about a transaction being all or nothing and if a transaction stops midpoint it needs to roll back sql server reserves the space for that rollback and when it actually rolls back for every operation that was written prior to commit sql server has to write an anti-operation or a compensation record to undo that activity and so for an insert sql server is going to generate a delete for a delete, SQL Server will generate an insert. And for an update, it's going to update it back to the previous value. And I'll demo this really fast. Um, so I've got a table out here. It's called rollback table. And I've inserted a thousand records into it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a temp table um, to store some information about the rollback. And I don't get into this in great detail, but I will have a link in the resources to a description from Paul Randall about this function. It's called FNDB log. It is a table valued function, which means you can access it just like you do a table. You write a select statement against it and it will dump out your transaction log. So you can run select star uh, from FNDB log. And then the two parameters here are log sequence numbers, the start and end log sequence number. Log sequence number identifies the log record. Um, and by passing in nulls, it will look at the entire log. So what I'm doing here is I am selecting from FNDB log and grabbing the max current LSN value. So that is effectively the LSN, the log sequence number of the last record in the log. And then I'm going to begin a transaction to insert um, a thousand rows into the table. And then once that's done, I'm going to roll that back. And then I'm going to select from FNDB log where my start LSN is that max LSN. So effectively, it's going to give me all of the log records that happened as a result of this begin or this transaction and its rollback. Um, then I'm going to select from that and then do some, pull some other information out. So let's kick this whole thing off. There it goes. That was the highlighted code. So yeah, I'm coming up on five minutes. So I've got demos for inserts, updates, and deletes. I may not get a chance to run all three of them, but I'll make these scripts available and um, you can try them out. And if you've got any questions, you can let me know. Uh, hopefully this one will finish in a decent amount of time. Okay, so that's my max LSN. That's what an LSN looks like if you're curious. And then this, so I grabbed all of the transaction log records that were associated with that insert and the rollback, and I wrote them into a temp table. And then I've got a query that does a select from that temp table, and it groups by... Um, operation, which is the insert or the delete, the context. So the um, what basically operation is what it's doing. Context is where it's doing it. Uh, a description and then an allocation unit name. And the allocation unit name will be the index or the table that is being affected. And then I'm grabbing the total space reserved and total operations. So you can see that this is my insert. So I did the thousand inserts 
and there were a thousand operations. Those inserts were happening to a clustered index, and this is the clustered index that was being affected. This top row are the compensation records. So I said that it's going to create the anti-operation or the compensation record, and those are deletes. And I'll talk about what Marcus Ghost means in a second, but you can see that there are a thousand of those, and it actually reserves negative 74,000 bytes, which is impossible, but it's just telling you that it, it overwrotes or undid those thousand inserts. Um, the mark is ghost. What that indicates is that when you do a delete from a SQL Server table, it doesn't physically delete the row. Um, on the data page that that row lives on, it flips a bit that indicates that that row has been deleted. And then there's a process that comes through and will clean up those ghost, ghosted records. Um, so if you're so inclined, I can give you a demo that will allow you to see that. And you can actually dump out a page and see that the row still exists on the page, just as a bit flipped. Um, so that brings us almost to time. As I said, I've got an example for um, deletes and updates, but it's effectively the same. You're going to see the same behavior. You're going to see the you know, insert or the delete, and then there'll be an insert as compensation or an update with an update as compensation. And I will send these scripts over um, so you'll be able to play with them and see what they're doing. Any other questions? I know it's a lot of information. Let me talk over the slides make sure. Um, so the resources section, more information about trend log architecture, so VLFs, and then pretty much everything that I've learned or that I've shown you, I've learned from Paul Randall. Um, he is the guy to talk to about the trend log. And so this is a link to his blog with all of the posts about the trend log. I think uh, Mike Hilvig from Boston area. Hi, Mike. Super presentation on what the VLF, uh, this amazing well received presentation. So I try to see if I can post the link for that one here too. Okay. Yeah, yeah Mike's, uh, Mike's awesome. Any other questions? No, I can put in a shameless plug in here for the Boston BI SQL Saturday coming up on 30th March. So, folks, that's a perfectly great time to be in Boston when the leaves are about to sprout and about 50% of the snow is already melted. So, if you are planning your vacation, that's a good time to come here. Uh, I think it's exactly one o'clock now. I don't see any more questions or comments. So we'll call it a day. Frank, thank you so much, my friend. I really appreciate your time. And until right. well, next time, till I come to Chicago, I will say, wait, one, there is one question that came up. Sure. Why were they waiting till the last second? Great job. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, awesome. Thank you, man. Okay, take care. All right, have a good day. Good night.